when, when Dan and I talked about what are we actually going to talk today, um, the monolith topic came up, and we were discussing, should we do a talk? Should I do a talk on monolith, or should we just have like a fireside chat? And we decided to settle on something in the middle. So what I'm going to do is tell you what we've done at Grubhub, and hopefully it will take me 10, 15 minutes. And I just wanted to talk to you guys, because I think that you, know, you could take the monolith conversation so many different ways. You could talk about tech, you could talk about process, you could talk all the considerations and all of that. And so I'm hoping that you have some hard questions at the end. So with that, 2014, that's when I joined Grubhub. So um, we had two monoliths. One was a seamless monolith written on .NET. We had a, a database, I think it was a, a 80 core SQL Server database, and Microsoft was like, you guys shouldn't be doing this <laughs> at this scale anymore. And um, Grubhub was remarkably identical product and remarkably identical architecture, uh, but uh, completely different stack. So it was a Java monolith, um, MySQL, and you know the, the other thing that was remarkably identical about these two things, uh, two uh, stacks, is they were both running out of headroom. So in, in those days, we were already growing really, really fast, and so we're setting records pretty much every weekend. And um, so we decided, okay, we need to do something. And, and so um, before I go to this, I just want to go on record and say, look, monoliths are actually not evil, right? You know, to some extent, I think that monoliths are sort of like the rite of passage. You know, when you're in the early stages of your company, I hope you're not spending too much time pouring concrete around the architecture you're building, right? I hope you're spending time thinking about your product, your customer, your business model. You know, and so it sort of starts with like, you build a proof of concept, it kind of works, you made a pilot, next thing you know, the pilot is successful, you scale it, scale it, scale it, until it's, it's, be, it's becoming hard to scale, right? And so some of the problems with um, monolithic architecture, you know, definitely stability is one, right? Because anytime you touch one thing on a whole platform, you change the whole platform, so you release the entire set. So that obviously creates problems. Second, the second is scale. Normally, um, typically, and there's some definitely some exceptions to the rule, but typically monoliths are hard to scale horizontally. And so, and then finally, there's you know, engineering pro process bottlenecks. So um, at this point, we're at you know a, a thousand people, and it's one thing to have five engineers working on a single code base. And you know, running really fast, they're all sitting in one room, they're talking to each other, they know all the releases that are coming out, coming out. And so but once you actually have a thousand people, there's there's it's just simply not possible to have a scalable concurrent process of uh, many engineering uh, work streams working on a single monolithic code, code base, right? So um, I, I sort of think of uh, migrating over to the highly scalable architecture as a, as a thing you eventually will have to do, right? But I also don't want to say that it's sort of like a, a, a thing that comes for free. Running a highly scalable, highly available platform at scale with microservices is, is expensive. You have to probably dedicate a lot of resources to it. Probably have to have a dedicated team to focus on this. So here's how we did it. And by the way, there's so many different ways to do it. Um, and you know, so like, our way worked. We have a happy story at the end, but it's more like a you know season one that lasted a little longer than you expected, and you won the war, and some of the good guys survived to the season two, right? But <laughs> there's you know definitely many different outcomes of how this could go. So in our case, you know I mentioned we had a seamless monolith and a Grubhub monolith, and we were like, well, one, we want to figure out how to scale this, and two. It doesn't make sense to have two identical products <laughs> running side by side. And so we were like, okay, let's migrate seamless traffic over to Grubhub while also simultaneously rebuilding Grubhub stack. And so, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it kind of is as crazy as it sounds. And so, so this here is, um, is my representation of an e-commerce stack, uh, e-commerce funnel, right? So you have high traffic at the top, and you know, as you as you keep going, you have lower traffic as you go down in the funnel, right? And obviously in the high scale world, the top hurts the most because that's where most of the traffic and so that's, that's how we decided to scale. Um, there are several things that are constraints for us. So one, we obviously had to continue running our business and at the time we were growing crazy and so we had to continue 
supporting both platforms while also migrating and rebuilding. And two, um, we knew that this will be a relatively long process. We can't go dark, so we have to continue to innovate and continue to build features. And so it, it had to be a gradual process, a gradual migration. <clears throat> and a lot of the things that I'll talk about in terms of like the how and, the, and what we did is around how to continue this business continuity, how to support rapid innovation while also migrating. Right? And then the second thing I'll talk about is, you know, at the end of the day, like what does it look like to run microservices at scale? So, so the, the first thing that was really, really important for us in the early days is to realize that, hey, you have to continue, continue running your business, right? And so we put some intelligent things in the, in the middle so we can tell intelligent components to route traffic. And so here you have our legacy apps and you have your um, new apps. Those of you that have iOS Android apps, you guys know that um, you don't control the migration cycle, right? The, the customers decide to migrate when they decide to migrate. And so you have to plan to be able to support legacy and new systems all the time. And so the routing layer sort of like serves as this intelligent thing where the app talks to it and says, hey, um, should I, go, should I go to this new route or should I go to this old route, right? And so like you sliver by sliver slowly migrate functionality off your platform and it's relatively seamless to the apps, right? They don't know what's happening. They're just, they're just, just talking to the platform. So that was, that was one thing that was really useful to us. It essentially removed the pressure for us to move on anybody's timeline. We said, you know, the apps don't care, so we, we're gonna move when we can move. Um, the, the, sec the second interesting part is user identity. So um, picture yourself, you have a seamless stack with seamless apps, you have Grubhub stack with Grubhub apps, and then now you have this new stack. And so obviously we had to revisit our um, authentication authorization scheme because you know, once you run multi-data center hot hot, it, it has to change. And so essentially we had a new stack that runs on uh, one set of identity constraints and authorization and authentication. And then you have other stacks that have other. Now for simplicity, I'm just gonna pretend there's one, right? Because otherwise I'll confuse you completely. So you have a le legacy stack and you have a new stack. You have two identity systems. So essentially our identity service that we built from scratch was aware of the second authentication schema, right? And anytime you made a request to it, it would hand out two tokens. And uh, essentially the app would be able to either use legacy systems or new systems and it would work. And um, one of the things that was important in this is that, so um, I'm a seamless user myself, right? And so I can use my uh, legacy iOS app to place an order at home, and then I can go to the office and use <coughs> a brand new uh, <clears throat> web app to place an order at work. And so orders would go through two dif different systems, but it has to look to me like nothing changed, right? And so here, here's a flow that could, could happen. I come in through the legacy platform and I create an account. And then tomorrow I come in through the new platform expecting that account to be there, right? How do you actually sync those two? So with identity, because we wanted to be able to be interchangeable in any given time, we actually build an on-demand sync to where essentially our customers, we call them diners, so our diners could hit any, um, any app and it will be completely seamless to them. Make sense? All right. And so, so this one is sort of like the extrapolation on identity, but really um, across the board. So our migration of, of you know, the, the key, key systems probably took about three, three and a half years. And during this time, it's, we always had systems that were on the new stack, we had systems on the legacy stack, and so you have to think a lot of data. Because, you know, so for example, the menu, um, menu we very quickly moved on the, on the new stack because that's a high, high traffic endpoint. But the menu management was on the legacy stack for a while, up until like last year. And so you have to think about every single, every, every single data structure, how are you gonna sync it? What's, what's the usage pattern? You know, what's the worst thing that's gonna happen if it's out of sync? And so for every single microservice you stand up, first of all, you're creating a copy of data that, um, <clears throat> that is now existing in two places, right? So you have to think, who is the single source of truth, right? Is it the legacy system? Is it the new system? How am I going to sync the data? And how am I going to repair the data if it gets out of sync, right? Because you obviously have situations where you started creating something and then you failed, right? Like how do you recover from this? 
And then also, obviously, all of the, the highly scalable systems, they do a lot of retries by definition. And so with retries, you have to think about item potency. So, so like you can't create the same order over and over and over again, right? So you have to pay attention to that. And happy to answer more questions on this later. All right, and so, so let's talk about the platform. Now, we, st we started this process in um, 2014. At the time, a lot of the systems that currently exist, like Kubernetes, like Mesh and all of that, like wasn't yet in production state, wasn't yet ready, and so we did build uh, quite a bit of things ourselves. And so when you think about how do you run uh, a set of microservices at scale, so we have 200. 200 of anything is really, really hard to manage. And so if you're going to run that type of scale, you have to push as much complexity as possible into the platform. And you probably have to have a dedicated platform team that is looking at it, thinking about it, monitoring your platform state, identifying problems and issues, and as, you know, con continuously refining it. Right? And so the things, the things that really were important for us, for example, is discovery services. So we use Netflix's Eureka. Uh, we really like it, we still use it. We've made a lot of changes to it, but that's, that's a great thing. So essentially, discovery is, is what, um, once you have 200 of something, right, you need to know like what to call, which version to call, and all of that. So a lot of the, every single release we do, we always release gradually. So we start with like, you know, a single point percentage traffic, roll it out, if everything is awesome, we increase the traffic, and eventually sunset the legacy, uh, or the old version of the, of the service. And so <clears throat> a lot of that traffic routing and traffic discovery and um, so, sort of like percentage routing, pressure, pressure breaking, and all of this stuff is something that's really, really important to have on a platform. The, the, the other thing that you know, I find is extremely critical is to make sure that you drive for homogeneity. So if you have an outage and uh, one of your services is crashing, you don't want your SREs to be wondering how it was written you know, where to look for the metrics or how to interpret the metrics, right? Like every, all the metrics must be universally the same. <clears throat> you know, the way that you restart services, the way you fail over, all of that has to be universally the same because you want to be able to have your SRE team support the entire platform, not just the sliver of the service that they understand. So that's, um, that's something that's, in my view, uh, comes from a strong architectural sort of like framework and you know, this re repeatable decision-making process so that the teams could make decisions independently every time they build something new without having to have like this global top-down decision-maker, right? Um, one other thing that we absolutely screwed up, absolutely, and um, <coughs> so I, I hope you guys don't, but you know, that Cassandra cluster over there, it looks as scary as, as, as <laughs> it is as scary as it looks. And it sort of like uh, caught up with us. So at one point I looked at our platform and we had uh, 200 Cassandra nodes and, and one Cassandra engineer who really, really understood what he was talking about. And I was like, oh shit. <laughs> and, and, and so like it, it, essentially, once you go in the microservice world, by definition you have many, many copies of data that's somewhat redundant. And you have to think about, about how you're gonna do this, who's gonna manage it, what's the process. How do you actually decide to like which copies of data you create? Who is going to manage this? And um, so th that's a problem in and out of itself. So don't don't make the mistake we made and solve it after the fact. Think about it upfront. And then a related problem to this is actually data warehousing. So you know we we sort of done this traditional ETL data warehouse thing where we suck data out of MySQL for a while. But then as we migrated more and more data into Cassandra and MySQL stopped being the source of truth, we sort of just like continued with this process of ETLing data out of Cassandra, which is like completely nuts. Because essentially what you have, so at this point our production is 500, well, 300, some 350 Cassandra nodes in production and another 150 in free prod. So trying to ETL 350, well, it's not really, uh, because a lot of them are redundant, but let's just say 100 uh, data stores, ETL in them out and then trying to like merge them in a consistent data set, that's, that's crazy. So um, we realize that that's not gonna work and so right now we're rebuilding the whole thing with sort of like the event hub where we essentially sync all of the business, business critical data in real time directly into the warehouse rather than 
stitching it together. Make sense? So um, <clears throat> I guess just one last data point uh, around what are we doing with the platform. I mentioned that we started building our platform when things like Mesh and Kubernetes were not around yet or not in, in a ready state. So we're actually currently actively looking to push even more uh, capabilities out of our platform into into the mesh, so that so that you remove a lot of. So for context, our, our platform was written in Java, which uh, essentially means that when you stand up services, the easiest thing to do is build, stand them up in Java, which is great, but you know not always not always ideal. Sometimes you want to do Python. Sometimes. You acquire companies that build their stuff in Ruby, and you want to be able to have them run on your stack as well. And so uh, the more stuff you push into Mesh, the less requirements you have on like, what is actually the tech stack that you use to build the, the business logic. And so we, we're currently doing that. All right. And so often, when I talk about what we've done and the fact that it took us almost five years to get there, right? people ask me, like, how did you get business, how did you get business buy-in? And so, so what you have here is a stylistic view of what a traffic pattern looks like. So you have the 9 a.m. lunch, uh, uh, breakfast, you have the 12 to 1 lunch, and then you have 7 p.m. dinner. And so that's when everybody comes to your site because everyone's hungry. It's like a perfect flash sale every day. And then if you add, so like let's say this is a rainy Friday afternoon, this, is, this thing goes like twice, right? And so, in our early days, we had this concept of Armageddon, which was essentially when your traffic reaches that uh, dotted line over there and your fails, service fails over. And it wasn't like a made up one. We've seen it happen. And so usually I was like running for, well, maybe I have three or four months before this next Armageddon happens. And so I could try to run, run, run fast. And, and, and so long story short, it wasn't really difficult for us to get a buy-in from the business because for us, staying up was actually the most important thing, because as you see, the traffic spike is relatively narrow, and that's when you make the most money. So you better stay up there, right? And so, <clears throat> so my CEO was always, you know, 100% behind me, get this done. But you know, looking back at the five years that happened, would I do the same thing exactly? Probably not. I probably wouldn't rewrite every little thing. Maybe I would be a little bit more frugal with what I rewrote and what I isolated and kept on ice and try to scale as a legacy system, right? So th that's just to say that, you know, I think that there's not a one right solution. There's many different ways to get this done. And, you know, like at every step of the way, you still have to evaluate and say, like, am I still, doing it? does this still make sense or is this religious? All right. All right, thank you, first of all. Um, and we have plenty of time for Q&A, um, and we got a great one off the slider to start. Um, so how do you decide when the performance hit of crossing the process boundary is worth creating a new microservice? Yeah, so, so we actually have this conversation quite a bit now, because you know what's interesting, so we acquired recently a company called Level Up, and we acquired a company called uh, Tapingo. And uh, Level Up, uh, also has some aspects of a, of a monolith architecture. And, and so I'm actually uh, working with a CTO of, of Level Up quite a bit, and we have this discussion. Well, is it worth it? Is it not worth it? And I think that there's not really like a, a rule of thumb, right? What you have to do is think about, okay, functionally and logically, what are the independent subsystems that have no business being together, right? Like forget the tech stack. Logically, would you separate the system from this system if you did it from scratch? If, if the answer is yes, then you probably should keep going, right? And, and then the, se the second part is you have to think about the trade-offs of, okay, it, it, will take co it will be definitely costly to separate, but you know, the flip side is, what, you know, what are you risking? Uh, a, a lot of that is team velocity, right? If, if you have to make uh, your team sort of like running concurrently and making changes, and a lot of that is stability. You know, for me, um, stability is a huge deal at Curve Hub. Uh, as, as you saw, we typically, if we go down, we go down during dinner. That means I don't see my family for dinner. And so I really <laughs> want to make sure that, you know, we don't go down. And so, so that's how we typically make decisions. You know, like, do you compromise your um, sort of like principles, your engineering principles, your business principles, 
with this architecture, and if not, then go on, right? And, uh, and, and but uh, going back to like, hey, there's a cost of um, moving back and forth, well, try to minimize the cost. Maybe, maybe create two copies of the data so that you don't actually have to cross back and forth. So there's many ways to do that too. So great questions keep pouring in. Please don't be shy about raising your hand also. Um, but uh, what kind of cost or performance benefits did you realize from the transition to microservices? So um, I, I, would, I would say this. When I, when I started at Grubhub, I uh, looked at our peak, peak days, and um, many of those peak days are related, uh, resulted in outages. And when I look at our peak days right now, they're significantly higher. There's probably like, you know, try, trying not to give out too many uh, <laughs> business numbers, but let's just say like times 10, right? And so if we, if we wouldn't have rewritten our systems, it wouldn't have been possible, right? So essentially, we would have been uh, leaving a lot of the money on the table and a lot of the uh, opportunity. That, that's just from the business side, but also I think that having, having microservices, having essentially separation of concerns enabled our teams to move a lot faster. You know, there's just no way I could have had a thousand people team running as fast as we do currently on that, on that tech stack. And not to mention all of the retention benefits. You know, engineers like to work on cool stuff. Excellent. Um, do you have a discount code? No, I'm just kidding. Um, how, how did the shift to microservices affect engineering org structure? You know, it's actually, I would say that microservices did not affect the org structure as much. I think what affected the org structure is the, is the growth. So when, uh, when, we, when I started at Grubhub, our team was 50. And at the time, we were focused around customer types, right? So Grubhub is a three-sided marketplace, right? We have diners, folks like us who order food online. We have restaurants, and we have drivers. And then there's the internal tools. And so in the early days, that's how the team was structured. And we ran like this for a while, and everything was awesome, until I started seeing that the process was no longer you know, effective and velocity was going down. Because most of the things we do at Grubhub don't just pertain to diner or just pertain to restaurant, right? If you're actually making, making a change, typically it spawns all of the code base. And so what we've done is we re reorganized. We actually didn't do a reorg because priorities change, projects change, right? Like it would, you wouldn't want to do a reorg every time you have a new priority. But what we did is we overlaid this like virtual structure of initiatives. You know, initiative is a container of ownership and it's led by um, a product tech and a business lead. And so, so like for example, New Diners is an initiative at Grubhub, right? And it's, it's kind of like a long running one because we always want New Diners. But there's a, a team that's focused on New Diner growth. And you know, believe it or not, New Diners actually have to make changes not just on the diner side, but also on the delivery side sometimes and on, on the restaurant side. And so we've um, pivoted to a model where you have your uh, product ownership and sort of like scope as well as code ownership on one team to you have code ownership, but then uh, product is spawning multiple different teams. And so there's a code ownership and a code contribution concept within Grubhub where it's like you own the system, but you can contribute code to this other system. Cool. Um, all right. Um, I had a question about, um, I mean, we spoke about how you at, were at Grubhub from scaling 50 engineers to, I think you said 1,500? 1,000. Or 1,000. Um, uh, and I think in hyper-growth mode with startups, you're often trying to launch features as quickly as possible, and you uh, have to balance that with building the right foundation and then also um, the right infrastructure. Did you have a framework in place to think through how to balance that in terms of, let's say you launch something in a very um, MVP way and then coming back to then uh, ensure that you were building the right foundation that would then enable um, scale in the future? Yeah, so it's, it's, kind of, it's a really hard, hard thing to do, right? Because on one hand, you hate to build a service that's going to potentially cause outages, at, you know, like in, in a way that you know, you know it will, right? On the other hand, you also want to move fast. And so so I, I typically, I mentioned earlier that I have a team, a platform team that's focused on platforms. So they're not a product-centric team. They're, you know, their customers are engineers. And so a lot of the, a lot of the things that, that this team does is make sure that you can easily stand up 
uh, a microservice that does the stuff without actually being concerned about the fact that you're sending it up in a hot, hot multi-data center world. Right? So like, uh, if you push a lot of the boilerplate platform code down into the platform layer, where the, where the engineers actually don't have to deal with this, then the cost of building it right versus the cost, cost of building it fast is really not a, you know, it's, it's not a major consideration or not a consideration at all. In fact, at this point, because there's so many different services and you want your service to be able to lean on a, on a platform for things like monitoring and, you know, RPC calls and, you know, traffic routing and all of that, like it's actually would be cheap, uh, cheaper for you to build it on the platform highly scalable rather than just build it to the side without scale. Make sense? All right, uh, and time for two more, one from the Slido. So do you think feature teams can effectively allocate time in normal sprints to work on transitioning to microservices, or do you recommend having a dedicated team? I think that the best one is where uh, feature teams do that, because I think that uh, you know, fundamentally engineers love to build awesome code, right? So it would be unfair to say, like, well, you build, you build like, good code and you, you just work for product, right? And, and so, so what we typically do is, uh, let's say a service hasn't been rewritten yet or hasn't been updated, right? Because I, I think rewriting is not necessarily the default. Sometimes you just need to refactor. So normally we'll talk with product, and product is our friends, and you know we'll say like, hey, we really need to do this because otherwise we're going to have to do this later and it's going to cost longer, right? And, and so we have a technical product manager. They understand what we're talking about. And so we normally either squeeze it in as a work stream in a normal sprint where you do some refactoring, or we could take a sprint and say, we're just going to knock it out of the park. It just depends on if it's easier to do things in parallel or if it's a lot easier to just stop and do it. But in general, I try not to go dark so that you continue releasing features and capabilities to the product while also doing some refactoring. So ideally, I think a perfect world is that you do it slowly over time rather than all at once. But hey, if, if your site is already on fire, like what does it matter which features you have? Like Stop, fix it, and then go. So uh, one of the questions I have is one of the ways you can uh, unify monoliths is uh, focusing on things like your messaging bus mm -hmm. and, uh, and using that to abstract so that your monolith is talking to one aspect and, uh, and it's still just speaking through this messaging bus so you can abstract your data store. Yeah. Um, the question I have is just, did that factor into the way that you looked at things? Did that help you accelerate and scale if you use that? Specifically, a lot of what my experience has been is like the Kafka type of, type of an idea, mm -hmm. where we uh, we abstract data before we uh, and unify that data so we can bring monoliths together. So anyway, that was my question. Yeah. So um, I think it's a great question. So like when you think about the platform, right? What does the platform do for you? One thing is communication, right? Communication between different components and systems. And so uh, Kafka could be a solution, but you know that's just part of the problem. Uh, platform, right? Uh, you know, discovery is another thing, right? You could do discovery in many different ways. It's part of the problem. Um, if you could take your monolith and, you know, forget about, like, the platform stuff, and if, you could, if, if this monolith could be scaled horizontally, then maybe you don't have a big, big problem, right? Maybe you just should do that. Most of the time, monolith is not uh, easy to scale horizontally because it has a single data store that is not horizontally scalable. And, and that, that's really the, the gist of the problem. If you don't have that problem, you probably don't need to rewrite. Well, Maria, I would just want to say thank you very much. Uh, thank you for sharing that experience with us. It was amazing. Sure, you're welcome.